Good morning. Welcome to the live streaming worship service of the Universalist Unitarian Church of Riverside. Today is July 5th, 2020. And we welcome you to worship with us with an open mind and an open heart. Together, let us draw breath for our opening hymn, Let There Be Light. Please rise in spirit and join us. Nobody will know if you sing off key, so all together. Covenantal poems. Together now. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament, and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to live in harmony with all the living creatures and plants of the earth. This do we affirm. Today our speaker is Jackie Casillas, MPP, which is Masters in Public Policy. Her, the title of her talk is Reproductive Juice, uh, Justice Through a Time of Uncertainty. Jackie's sermon description reads, Planned Parenthood is facing unprecedented challenges presented by the anti-reproductive rights of the White House administration and the COVID-19 pandemic. While across the nation, we are reckoning with the systemic racist racism that has proven deadly for so many black people. <clears throat> now more than ever, we lean into our reproductive justice framework to provide health care to our community. And through these uncertain times, one thing that remains clear is that everyone deserves access to basic, high quality, non-judgmental health care. Jackie Casillas, MPP, is a donor relations manager with Planned Parenthood of the Pacific Southwest, a leading health care nonprofit, providing sexual and reproductive health care to 133,000 people annually. She is also serving as the vice mayor of the city of Corona. She was first elected to serve on the council in 2018. Jackie has dedicated her career to serving marginalized communities, earning a reputation as an effective and collaborative leader. 
She got her start as a community organizer working with underrepresented communities to increase civic engagement. Since then, Jackie has led wide, uh, countywide Latino voter registration effort, collaborated to establish screening and treatment for low-income mothers suffering from postpartum depression, and has spearheaded countless initiatives to ensure access to high-quality, non-judgmental reproductive health care, regardless of income or immigration status. Aside from reproductive ju justice and municipal governance, Jackie enjoys a good pun, group board games, and exploring local trails with their husband, Zach, and their black Labrador retriever, Sao May. Hopefully I said that somewhat uh, in the ballpark. <laughs> we have a couple of announcements we'd like to share. Chat time is being held on Zoom one half hour after service every Sunday. During July and August, our services begin at nine o'clock. So chat time will be at 1030 on today and all of July and August. Just like it was once upon a time in real life live. But to participate in chat time now, you need a separate Zoom invitation. So please go to the website and uh, for the Zoom chat time invitation. That's at www.uuchurchofriverside.org. Camp Divinable Pines is closed through August. For updates and further information, please go to their website, www.uucamp.org. There's been a lot of COVID virus hype and misinformation circulating. You can get the most accurate and up-to-date information specific to Riverside County and San Bernardino County at these websites. Riverside University Health System, Public Health, coronavirus updates are at www rivcoph.org forward slash coronavirus and the San Bernardino County Public Health coronavirus updates are at wp.sbcounty.gov forward slash dph forward slash coronavirus. A word of caution Members of some churches have received scam donation emails pretending to be from their church or their pastor. If you receive an email asking for a donation, please verify if it was truly from our church. Do not click on any link and do not reply it to the email. Send a separate email to us or give a call to the church office. The church office email is admin at uuchurchofriverside.org. The church office phone is 951-686-6515. Now let us acknowledge that we walk upon the traditional territories of the Marenga, the original people of this land who continue to cry out for justice and self-determination. In honor of the Marenga people, we, the Universalist Unitarian Church of Riverside, light this sacred flame as the stewards of this sacred and holy place. We are blessed with a space and opportunity to strive to live out our common principles to bring justice, equity, and compassion into our daily lives, to resist all that threatens the earth and her people, and to live out our dream of a world community of peace, liberty, and justice for all. Let these thoughts carry us forth as we journey and worship together.
The chalice is the sacred symbol of our faith. We light it to remind us of the light of reason, the warmth of community, and the flame of hope. Our chalice lighting is a vision for universalist Unitarianism in a multicultural world by the UUA Leadership Council. With humility and courage born of our history, we are called as Unitarian Universalists to build the beloved community where all souls are welcome as blessings and the family, the human family lives whole and reconciled. With this vision in our hearts and minds, we light our chalice. Our next hymn is Now Let Us Sing. Please rise once more in spirit and join us. joys and concerns is an impart, important part of belonging to the beloved community. Each week, our Caring Network collects joys and concerns you wish to share. And on Sunday, we read what has been received. Please email or text your joys and concerns to Dinah Rowe, our Caring Network coordinator. Again, her email is ramblinrose22 at yahoo.com or you can call or text her on Bill's phone, 909-835-5467. One ongoing concern is that our church, like so many, has had a significant loss of income since the governor issued the stay-at-home order. We have canceled having paid speakers and furloughed our pianist, We've also made other significant reductions. Even, even so, our financial situation is difficult. New concerns. Glenn Granfield was admitted into the hospital for one day, but not overnight, and is reported to be feeling much better. I guess that makes it both a joy and a concern. I have a concern that people that I know and trust to know better are becoming impatient with this pandemic and may become less careful over time. A concern when shared is divided. We place a symbolic stone in our water chalice 
for all the concerns we have shared and all those we have not. Know that we are here to support each other. Dinah expressed a joy because Janice Levi has her friend Ellie to be with her each day to keep her company and help with meals. And I'm going to express a joy that we all survived the amateur fireworks last night. A joy when shared is multiplied. We place a symbolic stone in our water chalice for the joys we have shared and those we have not. Know that we celebrate together, if from a safe distance at this time. Sharing our stewardship is how we can give of ourselves. We take three types of collections every week, even now. The first two are for, for our Riverside community. Our social justice committee distributes food and hygiene items in front of our church every Thursday morning. We collect dry goods food as food items for the food insecure, such as pasta, granola bars, crackers, and powdered milk. We also collect hygiene items for anyone who needs them, such as toothbrushes, travel size, soaps, shampoos, shaving kits, and socks. Please email the church office to make an appointment to bring the food and hygiene items. Great Lakes Script Cards and State of Brothers Cards can also be donated to help purchase food and hygiene items. You can get these through our church office. Once again, the church office email is admin at uuchurchofriverside.org. Our third collection is sharing our treasure. This offering is how we fund all that we do to minister to and care for our congregation and our neighbors. That includes how we care for our beloved and aging church. We have several ways that we can accept your donation. You may mail your donation to the church office, please no cash. Our church office address is Universalist Unitarian Church of Riverside. It'll get here even if you just put UUCR. 3657 Lemon Street, Riverside, California, 92501. You can also make a digital donation. You can visit our website for a PayPal link at uuchurchofriverside.org forward slash community forward slash donate. Or if you have a smartphone, you can use the QR code displayed now to go to PayPal. We have a wonderful way to financially support our church at no cost to us and no extra cost to you. We have Stater Brothers cards for your grocery shopping that earns our church a percentage of what you spend. If you buy a card and go shopping at Stater Brothers, you might even find hand sanitizer, which it looks like we're going to continue to need for some time to come. Once a month, we order Great Lakes script cards, so we'll talk about that another time. Please contact Dinah Rowe or the church office to purchase State of Brothers cards. Once more, Dinah Rose, email is ramblinrose22 at yahoo.com, and the church office email is admin at uuchurchofriverside.org. You can also feel good about giving when making purchases through the Amazon Smile program. Go to smile.amazon.com. Be sure to have the smile 
and choose Universalist Unitarian Church as your charity. We receive 0.5% of your qualifying purchases. Also by using Amazon gift cards purchased through our script program, we receive both script card percentage and the Amazon smile percentage. You could also donate your talents and or sharpen your skills by volunteering to be a speaker, a worship associate like I am today, a musician or a singer. Maybe you're great on Instagram and you've noticed we aren't doing a lot on Instagram right now. We also have a Twitter account. What are you interested in that might be helpful to this church you love? If you're willing to be a worship volunteer, please email worship at uuchurchatriverside.org. Please donate and participate as the Spirit moves you by whatever method works best for you. Thank you for your generosity and to those who give of their time and their talent, thank you for your generous care and attention. Our meditation today is both the burning and the light, a reflection by the Reverend Sean Parker Dennison, a graduate of Star King School for the Ministry. It's in one tiny moment in time for life to shine, to shine, burn away the darkness. You've got one tiny moment in time for life to shine, to shine, to burn away the darkness. I will be the light. That's a poem, I Will Be the Light by Mat Matisse Yahoo and is the beginning of this meditation. About six months ago, I got a new tattoo. It's a lit match on my right wrist, added to an arm full of paintbrushes, pins, and other art supplies. As a minister, my tattoos are sometimes controversial, and I was a little nervous about what people would think about this addition. When people asked why I chose a lit match, I joked that it was either to burn the world down or light my inner chalice. These days, the joke is less funny because things have gotten more serious. As the new president signs executive orders that give tax breaks to the most privileged while attacking immigrants, refugees, Muslims, GLBTQ people, people with disabilities and everyone else that he disagrees with, I'm more and more committed to resistance. This deepened calling to a life of non-compliance will take a lot of burning and a lot of light. As an artist and religious leader, I believe in the necessity of creative destruction a magnet on my refrigerator says, go forth and set the world on fire. St. Ignatius, Ignatius Loyola. For me, it's a statement of passion and a reminder that in order for justice to flourish, injustice must be dismantled. In order for freedom to be real, fences, cells, and walls must be torn down. In order for forests to remain healthy, wildfires must burn away the overgrowth. I'm ready to embrace creative destruction as one of the tools we need in these times. But we need more than destruction. We also need to support each other. Lighting the flame of our common chalice, real or symbolic, is a powerful reminder that we cannot sustain ourselves by ourselves. We are not enough individually, and in enclaves of like-minded people are not enough. We need each other to share the wisdom of lived experience, 
to remind each other to keep learning and to love each other through the inevitable failures and eventual successes of our resistance. We need both the burning and the light. Spirit of justice, help us be courageous and committed in these times. Let us transform our ideals into action, our words into deeds. Let the fire of our passion burn with both light and warmth. In our anger, help us embody the spirit of creative destruction, always making room for more justice, more compassion, more love. May it be so. May we be the ones that make it so. Amen. Okay, I think this is my cue. Wonderful. Good morning, everyone. Um, it is such a pleasure to be with you this morning. I, I, I wish it could be in person like it has been in years past, but I'm just, I'm so honored to be asked to join you via Zoom. And I, I, I feel close to you all, even though I know we are so far apart during this time. So thank you again for inviting me to join you and for this opportunity to return. Um, again, I'm Jackie. Casillas. I'm a donor relations manager with Planned Parenthood of the Pacific Southwest. Um, and in this role, I essentially help with development. I help with securing funds, both with grants and through participation of, um, of donors across Riverside County um, to secure the funds that are necessary to ensure that folks have access to basic reproductive health care that's non-judgmental, that's good and high quality that will be there for them whenever they need it. Um, but uh, I, I've joined you in the past um, and have worked with some of you in the past with my former role. I was with the um, government community and government relations office, which is more of like a public affairs role. I was engaged um, and have worked with several of you on in manifestations around town, either in Riverside or other cities, um, organizing uh, supporters to get them to vote and uh, informing elected officials about what it is and what they need to do in order to stand for reproductive justice. So I've, I have worn several hats in the past, um, but I continue to serve with this organization that I love. I'm going on a little over five years now with Planned Parenthood of the Pacific Southwest. Um, I'm also, as mentioned, you know, the vice mayor in the city of Corona, your neighboring city. Uh, I was elected in 2018 to serve a four-year term. I, I represent District 1. We call our wards districts in the city of Corona. And in this year, I'm serving also in the capacity of vice mayor, which our mayor role and our vice mayor role are rotated among the five council members, not rotated on a set schedule. We're nominated and elected by our peers. So um, I proudly serve as the vice mayor in the city of Corona. Um, and have been able to take on that role for my hometown, uh, which I which I really love to do. And I would not be able to do it if I didn't uh, work for such a great organization like Planned Parenthood that not only walks talks the talk but walks the walk and supports electeds um, because these are not paid positions; they're stipend part time. So, anyhow, moving on. Um, as you know, Planned Parenthood is facing unprecedented. Uh, challenges uh, that are presented by both the anti-reproductive rights White House administration and the COVID-19 pandemic, which everyone is struggling through. Um, while across the nation, we're really reckoning with our nation's original sin, which is, um, you know, racism and, and where that has uh, progressed into systemic racism and has proven so deadly for so many black people in our communities. 
So now more than ever, Planned Parenthood is leaning into our reproductive justice framework to provide health care to our community. And through these uncertain times, uh, one thing that really remains clear is that everyone still deserves access to basic high quality non-judgmental health care. So today I'm going to share how it is that Planned Parenthood of the Pacific Southwest, um, our local affiliate, which covers uh, the three counties of Riverside, Imperial, and San Diego, how it is that we are meeting the challenges of the moment and ensuring that everyone has access to care. Uh, I will speak to the recent Supreme Court decision in June Medical Services versus Russo, which happened on Monday. Um, I will also speak on how we are delivering care at the health centers during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, how we've incorporated telehealth, and are working uh, on a soon-to-come education portal. We're also committed to the necessary work of being anti-racist, and I'll speak to that. And finally, um, we are also expanding to ensure that we can meet the needs of our community now and in the future. So that's what I will be covering in my conversation now. Uh, so let's jump in. On Monday, we had an excellent Supreme Court decision but it was actually quite narrow. It was a 5-4 ruling in the June Medical Services versus Russo. Um, and it affirmed what we've known for a long time. It is that it is an unconstitutional, it is unconstitutional to restrict abortion um, until it is made virtually inaccessible. The central uh, in the central point in this case was a Louisiana law that required abortion providers to have admitting privileges in local hospitals. It's a restriction identical to the one uh, of, of Texas laws um, that the court struck down four years ago in Whole Women's Health versus Hellerstead. Um, the court ruled that under that precedent, this identical Louisiana law, uh, which would have decimated access to abortion in that state, could not stand. Um, and to those of you who are just now learning about these, uh, these restrictions of, of admitting privileges, what it requires is that these health, our healthcare providers at these health centers that provide abortion need to be given a, um, a privilege at a local hospital um, that essentially has them being like a dual um, physician. And so that leaves their access up to sometimes the administrative boards of these uh, hospitals, which can sometimes, you know, there we still have hospitals that are, um, whose boards are, are um, more conservative or can be a little more political and therefore will not issue these admitting privileges. Um, and these are medically unnecessary because in case of an emergency, which is rare, um, patients are, cannot be denied access to a local hospital. So it's just a way to, one, create stigma around access to abortion care, and two, restrict abortion care so that it is essentially virtually inaccessible. Um, Far too many people, particularly people of color and people with low incomes, already live in a world where access to abortion care is nearly unattainable. So the ability to action, access these care is still determined by where you live, how much money you make, and the color of your skin. Racism is a public health crisis, and it can be as overt as police brutality or as subtle as state-sanctioned anti-abortion restrictions that disproportionately affect Black communities. For too long, we as a country have underinvested and under-resourced black, black and Latinx communities, leading to less access to health care and dramatic health care disparities. So this Supreme Court decision, this 5-4 decision on, on Monday, was really a reaffirmation that this access is important and you cannot make it virtually inaccessible, but we still have a lot of work to do to ensure that our Black and Latinx communities actually access is not denied because of um, systemic racism that underinvests in those communities. So that was Monday's Supreme Court decision, which was invaluable. During this time, during COVID-19, um, 
We're also having to find and change our operations and find ways to provide care at our local health centers. And we've been doing this in different ways. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, the policy changes that we've made in order to provide care at our health centers um, and how it is that we're still providing that care. So staff is currently wearing PPE, personal protective equipment. They greet patients with a temperature screening with those thermostats that look kind of like a, a, a you, you pointed at someone's forehead. Um, and patients are waiting in their cars outside of the health centers and they're being notified by text when they're ready to be seen. Um, to help meet patient demands while minimizing risk of exposure to coronavirus, we also introduced telehealth services that allows our patients to connect with a clinician from the safety of their own home. So it's kind of like a Zoom like this, but it would be just with the healthcare provider and the patient. Our expert staff also launched the program, this telehealth program, in just two weeks, um, even though we planned for a year-long rollout. So we were already planning to go into telehealth, um, especially to help our rural communities out in further east in Riverside County and south in Imperial County. Um, but we, because of COVID, sprang into action and, and rolled this program out in two weeks. It doesn't mean it was smooth, but it meant that this needed to get done, especially now. Um, otherwise, people were going to likely not get the access that they needed, get the health care that they needed. Our communities are really relying on Planned Parenthood to ease the demand on hospitals and emergency rooms so that those health facilities can focus on responding to COVID-19 cases. Um, as healthcare continues to be tied to employment as well, you know, right now there's folks who have been furloughed or, or who have been unfortunately let go. And Planned Parenthood has always been a safety net for a lot of folks who just need an annual visit or just need to see a healthcare provider um, that's accessible at low cost or no cost. And while some states and legislators are exploiting this pandemic, um, to restrict access to safe and legal abortion care, it's critical that we continue to provide essential services for the women and families who rely on us. As we've said, as well with the Supreme Court decision, economic inequality, structural racism, and public health failures have translated to exponentially higher COVID-19 infections and deaths, death rates in Black and Latinx communities. So we are trying to do our part to ensure that reproductive health care is not one of those things that goes unmet during this pandemic. Also, because of this pandemic, we are exploring one of the other um, pillars of the care we provide. So our mission at Planned Parenthood of the Pacific Southwest is to provide um, comprehensive, non-judgmental, high quality reproductive health care through direct services at our health centers, um, through education, and through advocacy. So our second pillar of education, um, we're also having to rethink how it is that we provide education during this pandemic. Um, one of the things that we would normally do is our educators would go out to the community and provide direct education to students at um, at schools, at, at, um, provide you know anatomy classes or healthy relationship classes, STI, STD um, um, classes. We have a curriculum of something like 15 to 20 different um, courses and we offer them all for free. So we used to be able to do that at schools and with the school closures in COVID-19, we have to get a little bit um, we have to change the way we're providing that care. Our healthcare educators are, are providing some of those um, courses still via Zoom with educators and school districts who want that service. Um, but we're also now creating an education portal, um, which we are really thrilled to, to expand access to comprehensive education and information through a sexual health education and training portal. This portal will feature online content for both the general public and for educators and school administrators. The portal will include courses and resources for teachers, school administrators, and social service providers who teach sexually, sexuality education as well as content curated for teens, students, adults, and parents, which is great. It's gonna be a one-stop shop for everyone. 
Planned Parenthood's education team is already ahead of the curve with their online presence. Um, their Sex Ed Live series allows people to ask questions and communicate with a sex educator in real time. And the Ask, ask the Sexperts features in-depth presentations on specific topics offered in English and Spanish. So we're doing our best to leverage technology to provide folks education on um, sexual and reproductive health care, even during COVID. Um, we have already, pre-COVID, we're using tools like Snapchat and Instagram to make sure that we're reaching out to young, um, our young uh, population and make sure that we're providing them with information and content to bust myths and help them live their healthiest life. Um, we're also very, very um, conscious of providing information in a uh, multi-language. Um, in fact, pre-COVID, and this is one thing that we haven't necessarily been able to translate as well during COVID, is we have um, uh, promotoras. So these are educators that go and provide direct one-on-one -on -one education, um, targeting a lot of our Latino community um, in locations um, in the community, finding folks while they're hanging out at the park or you know in the in the fields while they're taking a break before or after work um at laundromats um outside of you know uh, school activities when they're taking their kids into a health center or an hour or a community event um and just providing direct one-to-one -one education um, easily accessible in a native language um, with follow-up information on where they can access care for free to no cost or low cost. So that's the way we're providing now direct health care during COVID. It's changed quite a bit, um, but we are resilient and we're versatile and we're doing everything we can right now to ensure that health care is not one of those things that goes by the wayside because of COVID. Um, so the other thing, um, we've talked about um, the Supreme Court decision, COVID and its impacts, incorporation of telehealth and our education portal. I want to now speak to our commitment uh, of being an anti-racist organization. Um, Planned Parenthood of the Pacific Southwest's vision is a world where access to healthcare does not depend on who you are or where you live and where everyone has the opportunity to choose their own path to a healthy and meaningful life. To make this vision a reality, it is not enough to simply continue our existing equity and reproductive justice work. We must commit to specific actions to support our black com uh, communities in our region. Racism is a public health crisis. Public health, by definition, is built on the principle of saving lives, and there has been no greater threat to Black lives than violence, from blatant police brutality to centuries of policies that have systemically oppressed Black people to individual acts rooted in racism and white supremacy culture. We must confront how white supremacy of the past and present continue in the institutions we are a part of today, including our own organization. We acknowledge how the faults in our history have manifested today, including the implicit bias within our own organization, and we recognize that this is part of the problem. We acknowledge that for decades, Black organizations and leaders, especially Black women, have been leading the work to advance racial and reproductive justice. And this commitment is meant to honor their calls to action. So today, we commit to the following three actions. We will dismantle the systems of privilege and oppression within Planned Parenthood of the Pacific Southwest. This includes addressing the history of racism, sexual and reproductive health care, and Planned Parenthood's past what this means. Um, we are educating ourselves and our supporters about Margaret Sanger's connection to the eugenics movement and Planned Parenthood's history of devaluing the, live, the lived experiences of Black women and femmes. Ensuring our policies, practices, and our structure create a safer, more supportive, and equitable environment for Black staff, patients, and community members. We're expanding and reinforcing unconscious bias training and other training for our staff, board, and supporters. We're also creating space to explore how white supremacy culture 
anti-blackness and systems of privilege and oppression show up in the healthcare system, including in our organization. We are supporting staff and supporters in hard work and self-reflection and self-education. And we're launching structural opportunities for staff to connect, share and learn about their identities and experiences such as employee resource groups. So that's commitment number one. Commitment number two is we will focus on the health disparities that affect, affect black people in our region as we continue to promote health equity. And this includes working with patients and community advisors to better understand the needs of black communities and how blackness intersects with other identities. This also includes identifying disparities and unmet needs among our own patients through quality and patient satisfaction data. Lastly, this includes using a race equity lens when locating centers and services. And our third commitment is that we will use our advocacy power and resources to support, elevate, and center Black-led and anti-racism organizations who are leading the way. What this means is that it includes joining our national office and our local partners to call for a shift from a militarized police force to a model that prioritizes community-based solutions, education, and healthcare. This includes contributing significant financial and other resources to Black-led organizations, building social and economic power in Black communities, and also organizations doing anti-racism work identifying organizational structures and processes, uh, for example, vendor selections and partnerships, advocacy decisions, um, where we can do better to embed anti-racism work. And lastly, using our resources and our platform to promote Black-led and anti-racism organizations in our region and to engage staff and supporters in this work. So this is the next step in our work to build a more equitable and just organization, um, a more equitable and just movement, and a more equitable and just society. And we recognize that there is more that we will need to do um, if Black people are unable to exercise bodily autonomy, to live in their daily lives, or protest and the violence that is against, that's, that's against their lives. Um, without the fear of violence or murder, we can never achieve justice, let alone reproductive freedom. So this is our commitment to Black Lives, this is our commitment to our, our community, and we look forward to partnering with all of you as we move forward on these three commitments. Finally, I want to talk to you a little bit about, uh, a little bit about our future as well. Aside from the work that, the commitment that we're making to um, to be anti-racist. We're also um, investing in a time of great uncertainty, but knowing that our community needs access to care, especially our community in Coachella Valley, we are growing and expanding. Um, the Coachella Valley community is expanding and in response, um, our existing Rancho Mirage Health Center is being renovated to meet the region's current and future demands for Planned Parenthood services. The, the Rancho Mirage Health Center um, has and uh, provides care for residents in Coachella Valley, an area that spans 45 miles and it totals, um, uh, and it's in Eastern Riverside County. The center provides care for an incredibly high rate of individuals living in poverty, it's totaling 68% of our overall patient base at, the, at this particular location. This health center was opened in 2001, and the facility is one of the busiest health centers in our three-county region, um, and it is already operating at full capacity. The site currently sees 12,744 patients per year, and it serves as our flagship center in the region. Construction will double the size of the center, and it began in February, so pre-COVID but it was halted shortly after due to the challenges presented, presented by the pandemic. The, revenue, revo, ugh, sorry, the renovation officially resumed in early May and it is projected to complete on October 16th. This improved space will add exam rooms, um, space for our patients and more space for us to get together and care for our community. 
it will serve at the end of its completion over 18,000 patients in the future. So that is a snapshot <laughs> of how it is that we are providing care during this time, how it is that we are meeting this moment, and what it is that we have ahead of us, which is quite a bit. Um, I invite all of you to connect after this. We can connect via Zoom, uh, via email, via phone. I would love to share more about how it is that here locally we're caring for our community, how it is that you can support that work. Um, and I can't wait until we can actually meet in person in the future and we can meet for coffee or I can join you all for a service on Sunday um, to talk a little bit more about and give another update. So that's it for me. Thank you again for the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jackie. Our, our closing hymn today is Come, Come, Whoever You Are. Please rise in spirit and join us. Come, come, whoever you are, wonder, worshiper, lover of living, ours is no caravan of despair. Come yet again, come, come. benediction, please close your eyes and read out, reach out to each other in your thoughts. Feel the connection between us, the interconnected web joining us as a community, a church family. Our benediction is Closing Words for Hard Times by Maureen Kaloran. No matter how weak or how frightened we may feel. We each have gifts that can make a difference in this world. And this coming week, may you at least do one thing to support the broken, to welcome the stranger, to celebrate what is worthy, to do the work of justice and love. Be strong. Be connected. Each day, act so you may be a little more whole. Amen. Shalom and blessed be.